Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Uncast. As always, I'm your host, John Panazzo, and on today's episode, I want to talk a bit about Windows 11 VM support and provide kind of a state of the union on gaming in a VM. So Windows 11 was officially released on October 5th, and thanks to some help from one of our key community members, we are adding official support for running it as a VM in Unraid 6.10. Now, there are plenty of articles online detailing the new features of Windows 11, but it's mostly cosmetic UI changes along with some other quality of life improvements, including the ability to run Android apps, improvements to DirectX, and biometric authentication using either a camera or a fingerprint reader. What I'd like to focus on in this episode are the requirements and the process for both updating uh, to Windows 11 and installing from scratch. So let's address the elephant in the room right away, and that means talking about TPM. So for those that don't know, TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. It's a tiny piece of hardware built into most modern computers that provides additional security features. Now, there are a plethora of articles online that explain TPM in great detail, including articles from Microsoft themselves um, explaining why it's a requirement in Windows 11. I'll be honest with you, they're a little hard to read through if you're not a security researcher, but you know, if you're curious, They're out there. Um, The reason I'm bringing this up is because in Unraid 6.9 and in earlier releases, we do not have support for TPM. That means that users who have been trying to update to 11 have probably been seeing a message from the update assistant saying that there is no TPM and therefore the machine isn't eligible for updating to Windows 11. That being said, we are actively working on this and intend to have Windows 11 support with the release of Unraid 6.10, but there are some things you should know ahead of time. First is that as of this moment, um, the development team has a working build, which works for both installing new Windows 11 VMs and upgrading existing Windows 10 VMs to 11. The upgrade process does require you to change your BIOS type to OVMF TPM, but we preserve the VM's identity through this process. However, for those that are using CBIOS VMs, initial research has led us to believe that the only way you will be able to update to Windows 11 is if you first convert from CBIOS to OVMF with TPM. The reason for this is that CBIOS, while technically capable of supporting Secure Boot, is not recognized as compatible to the Windows 11 installer. And CBIOS VMs differ from OVMF VMs in that they do not use a true UEFI-based BIOS, but rather a legacy BIOS with CSM support. Okay, so that was a lot of technical info there. So let's get down to brass tacks on what that all means to you. So first off, if you don't have any CBIOS VMs today, you shouldn't worry about this. If you have a CBIOS VM that doesn't utilize GPU pass-through, it's easy to convert that to OVMF TPM, and I'm actually working on a guide that I'll have posted to our wiki soon enough to describe the process for this. Now, if you have a CBIOS VM that does utilize GPU pass-through, there is a chance that upgrading to Windows 11 isn't in your future on that device. Now, the primary reason a user would have a VM with GPU pass-through and use CBIOS is in the case where the GPU being utilized doesn't support UEFI. This isn't entirely uncommon with older model GPUs from five plus years back, but most modern GPUs all support UEFI nowadays, so users with modern hardware really shouldn't concern themselves. Um, There is another case, however, where you could have a CBIOS VM that doesn't need to be, And this could be the case where your GPU manufacturer has a vBIOS update for the card that adds UEFI support. I know that years ago, I had contacted EVGA about my G4 650 Ti, and they actually supplied me with a ROM to flash to the card that added the necessary UEFI support. And there's also technically one other case where you might have a CBIOS VM with GPU pass-through that doesn't need to be, and that's if you've been using the same gaming VM going all the way back to the Unraid 6 betas, I mean, hats off to you if you if you are. Um, that's cool. And the reason that might be the case is that back then, I think CBIOS was actually our default in the early iterations. So if that's the case, then again, you should be able to convert uh, to using OVMF TPM, and that won't be an issue. So the truth is, is that overall, this really shouldn't affect the majority of our users. But we're not done looking into this yet because... You know, there might be some people that are, are, are not going to be able to update to Windows 11, and, and we're not happy about that. So we're, we're looking into this to see if there's something else that we can do, uh, and we'll keep you posted on that. So now let's talk about the upgrade process this, itself. Um, before you go running to grab a pen or a pencil, just know that all of this is being documented in our wiki. So we'll have full guides available before the release of 6.10 Stable on how to do all of this. So don't worry about trying to transcribe. I know I talk really fast. Okay, so the first step in the process is going to be to back up the existing VM. So while everything should work fine, making a backup is simple enough, 
and protects you in case something goes amiss during the process. If your virtual disk is located on a drive formatted by ButterFS or ZFS if you're using the plugin, making a backup is as simple as making a copy with the parameter dash dash reflink included. Reflink copies are great because they're kind of like snapshots. Uh, they don't consume additional disk, set, disk space, but rather they simply freeze data at a point in time and then create deltas for any changes to either the copied file or the original file. And if anything goes wrong, you could always just revert to the copy uh, from before the upgrade attempt. Okay, so the second step in the process will be to download the upgrade assistant and af afterwards the PC health check. So you, you'll go to the, the Windows 11 website to download and there's a tool that you download. Uh, once you download that tool and you run it, the first thing it's going to tell you to do is to run the PC health check. There'll be a link and it makes you download another little MSI file and you install. And then that health check comes up and then there's a button you click that says check compatibility basically. And it'll tell you whether or not your underlying hardware is compatible with Windows 11. So there are definitely some systems with older CPUs that cannot upgrade, including my relatively modern uh, i7-7700K CPU, which is only four years old. Uh, when I ran the PC Health Jack, it told me, nope, sorry, not available for upgrade to Windows 11. I was like, oh, that's that kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, but when running the PC Health Jack, it'll make those determinations for you. Now, if all it complains about is the lack of TPM, lack of secure boot, maybe storage capacity, you can still move on. But if it claims that your CPU is too old, too old you're going to need to upgrade your hardware before you can upgrade the OS. So then the next thing we need to talk about is storage capacity. So Windows 11 requires that your VDisk be at least 64 gigs in size in order to upgrade. If your VDisk isn't large enough, you can expand it within the VMs tab. So when the VM is stopped, you click the name of your VM on the VMs tab, and you'll see a section expand underneath that shows you the attached storage devices. Then you'll click the size of the current VDisk, and you can change it by typing in a new value and pressing Enter. Now, doing this alone won't change the size of your C drive in Windows just yet, because all you did was increase the size of the disk. The second step in the process is to extend the partition of the C drive to utilize that newly extended space. Unfortunately, Windows doesn't do a great job of anticipating this scenario, and the extended space is placed after the recovery partition Windows creates during initial installation. This means that you'll need to delete that recovery partition before Windows will let you truly expand the C partition. Thankfully, there is a documented procedure in our wiki already on how to do this, and it's incredibly simple. So we'll link it in the description. Uh, now let's address a step that only CBIOS users that can upgrade to Windows 11 will have to worry about. In this step, you will need to convert your existing virtual desk from an MBR-based partition format to GPT. Uh, you can do this from within the Windows VM itself. And thanks to community member All Turismo, uh, these steps were actually found in our forums. It essentially involves running two commands, one to validate and the other to actually convert. And afterwards, you'll need to shut down your VM, and then you'll change from using CBIOS to OVMF TPM. And we'll have a guide on how to do that. Uh, for existing OVMF users, you will simply stop your VM, edit your VM, change the BIOS type from OVMF to OVMF-TPM, and save it. And now you're going to start your VM, and everything should boot normally. And once again, you'll start the upgrade assistant, and the PC health check should pass just fine. The upgrade process itself can take some time, so you'll need to be patient. Now, I tested this on an Odroid system that we have that had a 4-core uh, 1.5 gigahertz Celeron processor. I couldn't believe that that processor was supported for Windows 11, but my i7-7700K wasn't. But hey, it is what it is. And I will say this much, it took a very long time to upgrade. I mean, maybe four plus hours of just sitting there and watching paint dry. Uh, but with more modern equipment, it could go a little faster. So is the process for upgrading pretty involved? Eh, it's not that bad. Uh, but this is the first Windows OS release that I've witnessed that straight up denies relatively modern hardware from upgrading. So follow the process, verify compatibility with your gear, and plan for a hardware upgrade if it's not. There's one last thing that I do want to note about this upgrade process that I noticed, which for those of you who have been using Unraid with Windows VMs long enough, you'll, you'll remember this too. There were a number of times with both Windows 7 and Windows 8 and Windows 10 where there would be like a service pack that would come out. And in order to apply that service pack to the VM, first you'd actually have to shut down the VM and drop the core count assignment down to the first core, to core zero, and just that core. And then let the upgrade run. And when it was done, you could shut down the VM, re-edit your core assignments, and then start your VM up again. And if you didn't do that, 
it would actually fail during the upgrade process. You get a blue screen. That was so annoying. It was really annoying that people had to do that. I hated that people had to do that. We couldn't find any other workarounds to it. It was just the way it was. I'm happy to report that in Windows 11, that is no longer the case. Windows 11 just freaking works. So <laughs> you don't have to mess around with your core assignments. You don't have to drop anything down to one core. Just leave it alone, and, and it's good. Okay, so next up, I want to talk about uh, gaming and uh, specifically VM-based gaming in 2021 because it's been a while since I've talked in depth about this subject and I wanted to give my candid thoughts on how things are going in this space. Uh, so first and foremost, let's talk about performance. I I've actually been very pleased at gaming performance for VMs on Unraid since we launched version 6. It was one of my personal wants as far as features go and the main benefit is being able to consolidate your investment in computer hardware between your server and your gaming desktop. Uh, years back, we definitely saw performance issues that would affect very specific games and very specific game engines. The original Borderlands actually exhibited very odd behavior at times where the frame rate would drop significantly for a short burst and then bounce back. And we actually found that it had something to do with debug registers being used by the game engine that would in turn cause massive performance drops for VMs that might not have been seen on bare metal configurations. Now, thankfully, we haven't really seen that continue much over the years. Uh, you know, obviously, the Borderlands is still affected. That original Borderlands is still affected. But other games that have come out since then, they, they seem just fine. Um, even when uh, uh, NVIDIA released their RTX series cards, you know, RTX gaming in a VM works fine. Um, however, we do have to talk a moment about certain games choosing to ban the use of VMs for multiplayer. And I'm specifically referring to at least two titles that are taking those actions right now. One is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and the other is Escape from Tarkov. Now, there, there may be more games out there that are doing this right now or intend to do it, uh, but I know that these two in particular are doing it. Now, with, with CSGO, with Counter-Strike, I think it only applies when you're playing on competitive servers, because I play on casual servers all the time now in a VM, and I've never had issues with it. But it still begs the question, you know, why ban VMs? And the answer is because developers see VMs as a new threat landscape to hacking online games. Okay, let's pause there for a moment, because I want to talk about the types of hacks that people use in these online games. And let's specifically drill into hacks for shooter games, because shooter games are some of the most popular selling genres out there, and it's probably the most common genre for cheaters to hack within. Now, in shooter games, there's really three types of core hacks that people use. There's ESP, otherwise known as wall hacking. Then there's aimbot. And then there's radar. Now, ESP hacks work by loading software at the same time or prior to the game launching, and that uh, software can read from your computer's memory and decrypt information that you're not supposed to have access to, including where players are in the game, what weapons they have, their health, their armor, and where all the lootable objects are in the game. All of that data is on your PC when you're connected to an online match, and as such, you just need the right tool to gain access to it. The ESP hack then renders that information on your screen in a usable format called an overlay. This overlay draws on top of the game's visuals to show you where the enemies are in a way that's incredibly easy to interpret. Basically puts boxes around the player models and things like that. Now, aimbot hacks work in concert with ESP hacks by taking control of your aim and forcing it to lock onto enemy targets. So you essentially just have to click to kill, and the aimbot does all the rest of the work. Worse still is the fact that many modern games have mechanics that allow uh, ammo to penetrate walls and other surfaces, allowing aimbot users to kill with incredible ease, even when the enemy isn't truly visible on their screen. So ESP and aimbot hacks are the most egregious form of hacks as they completely reduce the game down to click to win. However, they're also some of the easiest to detect. And the way these hacks are detected is through the use of anti-cheat software. So how does anti-cheat software work exactly? Well, companies like BattleEye, Valve Anti-Cheat, Vanguard, Easy Anti-Cheat, and even proprietary anti-cheat solutions developed by game developers themselves all use the same general methodology to combat hacking. First, they go and find all the various cheat tools that they can available on the internet. Many times they will sign up for paid accounts to these cheat websites just to get their hands on the tool so they can analyze it. Then they build a heuristics engine that looks for common properties that these hack tools have so they can automatically detect their signature and ban offending users. However, this is a giant game of cat and mouse and one that is impossible to fully solve. Cheat developers themselves have a few ways to get around this. The first is to recompile their cheat programs very frequently, changing the overall signature that they come with. 
This puts a lot of work on the users of the cheats to have to restart their PC or reload the cheat software after every single match, but it can allow these users to cheat undetected for a long period of time, but you have to be very committed to following the guidelines, otherwise you'll be detected and banned permanently. The other manner that these hack developers use to get around the anti-cheat is by not publicly selling their cheats at all. Instead, they find individuals that are willing to pay ridiculous sums of money uh, to, to get the hack. And uh, we call these private hacks, right? And these anti-cheat companies don't get access to these private hacks because they aren't available for purchase on the public market. Now, this doesn't mean that these hacks can't be detected at all, but it does mean that they are far harder to detect than publicly available ones. However, something worth noting about ESP and aimbot hacks is that as far as I know, there is no cheat tool yet that allows ESP or aimbot to work by being loaded onto the hypervisor of a virtual machine host. So in order to use ESP or aimbot in a virtual machine, VM users actually have to load the hack software directly into the VM, which is no different from a traditional Windows PC and therefore not a good justification to ban VMs outright. So then why do they think VMs are a risk? The answer is in the third hack type, which is radar. Now, radar hacks work by rendering a top-down visual of the map that you're playing, highlighting where all the, play, the, the enemies are uh, in real time. Radar doesn't provide for an aimbot, nor does it provide the ease of use of ESP by drawing directly on the screen that you're using to play. But it does tell you where the enemies are coming from, which can be all that matters in some games to give you enough of an advantage to win. To use a radar hack within a VM, a user could load software on the host system, right, the, the hypervisor, that can then read from system memory in a way that the underlying VM can't detect. And this is why certain anti-cheat developers are promoting the idea of banning the use of VMs. However, radar hacks have existed far longer than VM gaming has even been possible. How, you may ask? By decrypting network traffic, not system memory. So instead of loading a program that has to read from Windows memory itself, you can load a program on a completely secondary system, sometimes even mobile devices. And that program is set up to then intercept the packets of data being sent between your router and the gaming machine. The tool then decrypts those packets and provides the exact same benefit of rendering that information on a map that you can use to pinpoint player locations. And this is where I have my first issue with anti-cheat developers. They are targeting VM users because there is a different attack vector, but so what? Those users could just load the radar on a secondary system and get the exact same information. My second issue with banning VMs uh, for gaming is that eventually we will be able to fully mask our use of a, as a VM or of a VM to the host and underlying software, preventing anti-cheat from de developers from detecting the use of a VM in the first place. So why bother stomping down? All they're doing is encouraging cheat developers to spend more time on perfecting their hypervisor-specific attacks to get around all of this work anyway. And lastly, Hacking itself is evolving. Anti-cheat developers are not going to be able to continue this cat and mouse game forever because eventually AI-based hacking will take over. There is already one project doing this by using a game capture card to read the screen in real time and using AI to detect players moving on the screen and highlight them to the player using the hack. The problem with this method is that it is truly undetectable as the method being used doesn't sideload any software nor need to read from any system memory or decrypt any network packets. It's like having a really smart robot stand behind you and point on your screen where he sees every player that to you is only visible as a speck. So where does this all leave us? The truth is that there are still a plethora of games out there that don't actively ban users just for gaming inside of a VM. And while it certainly frustrates me that my personal favorite game, Escape from Tarkov, decided to go down this path, there are so many other things to play out there that you can't be worried about the one-offs like this. So now I direct a question to you, our listeners. What do you think about gaming in a VM nowadays? What games do you play? Have you ever been banned for using a VM? And if so, in what games? Please let us know in the comments. I'm very curious because I, you know, I don't have as much time to play games nowadays as I used to. And when I do, I tend to gravitate to only a few games that me and my buddies play. So for our community out there that probably has a much wider reach and a much wider game library, give us this feedback. It's really important. We really want to know this kind of stuff. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for today's episode. Be sure to stay tuned to the forums for upcoming announcements relating to Unraid 6 and Windows 11 VM support. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks, everyone.